because uh, your astronaut just had a heart attack. And we tried a surgeon with now bacon. What would he do if we had a sick astronaut in orbit? So basically, the, uh, the process was extremely rudimentary. It was uh, typical, I think, of the uh, early jet fighters they had in there, where basically you spent a lot of time in a cockpit. And basically, you got your flight plan, you knew your procedures, and you uh, basically applied the throttle and started moving forward. So that was, that was Mercury. Well, Walt, uh, even though you're all, you're all pilots, in terms of training, you're a Marine, so you went through particularly difficult early training, I assume. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Yes, sir. Understood. <laughs> Um, but how was the training process for you, given what you've already been through in training, um, for you to become an astronaut to be accepted? Well, back in the days when I was flying, at the time I came to NASA, I was flying with the reserves, because I decided I ought to go to college when I was 24 years old. So I was started college there, and I was flying with the reserves, and uh, I don't think I, for this audience, I would exactly my reaction when I was listening to uh, Alan Shepard's first liftoff, but uh, I wanted to be a, a fighter pilot, which I was felt quite successful at being, and uh, it was after Alan Shepard's first liftoff, May 5th, 1961, and uh, well, I will tell the story. Uh, at that time, I was uh, working half-time at the Rand Corporation going to UCLA, lived in Canova Park, had to go over to Santa Monica every morning because I was trying to earn a living. Uh, back in those days, we did not get free college and all that. And uh, I was listening, it was a little before seven, I was listening to the countdown of uh, the first Mercury mission. And when I got down to the last five minutes, I could not go any farther, I pulled over and parked the side of the road on Mulholland Drive, and I'll never forget, we got down to three, two, one, liftoff, and I heard, I heard this voice screaming out here, you lucky, what, SOB. <laughs> I just cut it short. <laughs> and I was, first I was looking around to see what it was, and I realized it was me <laughs> doing that <laughs> screaming. <laughs> And that was when I decided what I was going to be trying to do. And two years later, I was uh, I was sharing, two and a half years later, I was sharing an office with Alan Shepard. Wow. Frank Borman, Frank Ben, how was, how was the training process for you uh, once you were selected as an astronaut uh, to be then selected to actually fly? How tough was the process, or not? Well, it really wasn't that difficult, but it was uh, involved an awful lot of learning. We spent, uh, uh, it, can you hear me now? It, we, we, uh, we spent an awful lot of time in the different factories, and uh, we went to uh, academic courses and so on, but it was, it was uh, basically a, a, a course in immersing yourself in a new, a new industry. At least uh, for me, it was new rockets. I don't know if you guys have been around rockets before. I never have been around. Right. So, Al, even though you've got W, right? I'm always jealous. Yeah, you poor guy. Um, but W, how was the process for you in adapting after the flying career? Um, it really wasn't a big transition. I was uh, teaching at the test pilot school at Edwards. I had gone through the Empire Test Pilot School in England. Um, I worked for a guy by the name of Chuck Yeager, uh, who was a rather interesting individual. Um, and uh, Bob Buchanan was the uh, deputy, uh, and uh, Jay Hanks, Norris Hanks, was the head of academics there. Uh, when I got selected into the program, well, I have to tell you, the first thing that happened is that I got assigned to Wally Shura. Uh, While well, he was a captain in the Navy, and I was a captain in the Air Force, and I went in and, and let him know that we were both captains, and so I really didn't have to worry about what he had to say. And, and, and I found out I, f I found out that I was very quickly sweeping his floor and getting him coffee uh, because because that's what happens to greenies, that's what happens to newbies at, uh, at down in Houston. Uh, we we weren't worth much until we made a flight. Uh, but 
I didn't see a lot of transition for me because one of the first things we did was we got checked out in T-38s and we started flying. And then we went through a classroom session of about six months. And after that, got signed to an engineering program uh, on Apollo 9. And of course, when we had the fire at the Cape, I was on the recovery engineering group at the manufacturer. And so there was a lot of engineering to do, and that would have been the kind of engineering I would have done anywhere. So it was only after all of that that I really saw some difference. Uh, I got assigned to uh, Apollo 12 backup and then Apollo 15 prime crew, and it was uh, quite different. So. Gene Kranz, I, in, the, in the video, uh, I talked about the fact that each mission was built on the successes and lessons learned from the mission before. How much was learned from Mercury leading into Gemini, and how successful was that process to get to the two-man flights in Gemini? I think the transition was uh, relatively smooth. We had uh, experienced crews coming out of the Mercury program, but generally it were the mission commanders, the commanders that moved into the Gemini program. So then they moved the back of some of the newer astronauts in there. By this time, however, the simulation process had really uh, expanded almost exponentially. We had basically systems that could fully represent uh, the spacecraft systems. We had basically computers, a very simple computer on board the Gemini spacecraft, about a 4K machine. But basically this now provided the astronauts information as to some of the things that were happening to them once they got on orbit. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the real breakthrough in training occurred during the process of simulation because now we had an instrument that would basically complement the classroom and the learn by doing because we all spent a lot of time in the factories working the procedures down at the Cape with range safety and all that. So basically this combination of learn by doing, okay, and then take that and apply it during the simulation training process you had. So those first Gemini missions including Ed White, what was that, Gemini 4? Gemini 4. four was the first EVA, but those first few Gemini missions, how successful were they uh, leading up to what we're going to talk about in a moment with Gemini 7? Well, Gemini 4 was the uh, EVA. I wrote the uh, procedures. Actually, uh, I got a call because that was my first mission as flight director. And uh, Kraft called up and says, are you ready for your flight director? He says, yeah. He says, that's good. He says, because we'd like to do an EVA. Ed White's been in training over in the uh, laboratories over there with some of the equipment they had. And what I want you to do is go over and basically get fully knowledgeable of the equipment he's using, what are the tasks he's trying to do, what are the kinds of limitations they got when you apply it within the spacecraft. Uh, and basically it was just to sit down and talk yourself through what you were trying to do and then try to translate that into procedures. We had a marvelous crew systems division with absolutely superb engineers that were providing the hardware. So. Again, it was uh, one of these things, that, you know, at that time, risk was virtually everything we did, but basically we became adept and good managers of the process of the missions we flew and basically controlling the risk associated. What happened with six that led to seven with that Frank and Jim flew? What happened with six that, that allowed seven to happen? Frank or Jim, you want to grab that? Jim? Well, of course, what happened Way to go was the fact that six was all set to do the first rendezvous, and uh, the and it, it was uh, uh, was it was a uh, oh it was a uh, Frank what no no well Gina but who was in the six the Russell Stafford and Schwab that's right Shepard and We're the same age. <laughs> anyway, uh, with Stafford and Schwab, we're going up at six, and uh, uh, and the Gina was launched. The Gina was lost, and so uh, they had to recycle. And here's where good management came into play. Uh, seven was going to be a two-week mission, <laughs> so can we recycle a ball or Gemini six to go rendezvous with seven? Now seven did not have a docking uh, device on it. But can we just, you know, prove out the rendezvous? So that's exactly what they did. We were up for about uh, eight days, I think, at the time. And then, then there was a second attempt to launch, and uh, the engines ignited uh, on, on the vehicle, and it shut down right away. Fortunately, uh, Wally Schwab was a little slow with doing the aborts. <laughs> And 
consequently, everything was fine. And so I think on day 12 of our flight, uh, six took off and did the rendezvous. And so we accomplished that rendezvous uh, by good management and, and seeing how we could get uh, Jiminy six up with seven. You notice that Frank and Jim are sitting next to each other. They broke the record at the time for length of time in orbit, and that was Frank and Jim together in Gemini 7. And Frank, how, I how was know, I, would, I would like to know how many people in the audience would like to spend 14 days <laughs> in a volume as small as the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> with a sailor. <laughs> Describe what those 14 days were like. Togetherness takes on a new meaning, perhaps. Well, as a matter of fact, we got down after 14 days and we're on the uh, carrier. The first thing we did, we looked at each other and we said, we just wanted to announce our engagement. <laughs> Men say when they open the hatch. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, it, it was pretty smelly in there. <laughs> but uh, Jim and I didn't notice it because we'd, we'd gotten used to it and it was fine. But the one thing he did mention, I do remember, Jim, that, that we sang one song for 14 days. One song. Let's pretend that we're all together, all alone. Remember that Jim Reeves song? <laughs> Put your sweet lips away. I didn't know he was transgender at that time. <laughs> you soon found out. <laughs> was a success in more ways than one. <laughs> I think it was beginning to sound like a Get Shira night, but maybe it's going to turn into something else at, at this point. Um, 